Today I have five beekeeping tips for the month of April and a giveaway, so stay tuned. Hey guys, David Burns, good to be with you again. We've got a great video now. This one is gonna be a good one to help all of you, whether you're a new beginner or you've kept bees for a while. These five tips of what you should be doing in the month of April, I really think this is gonna be really helpful. Let me give you the five tips all together and then we'll drill down into each one of them more specifically. Stay tuned because I do have a giveaway coming up. Tell you more about it in just a few minutes. Tip number one is gonna be all about making those splits. Tip number two is gonna be about swarm control. Tip number three is gonna about, be about when to add those honey supers, how soon, is it still too cold to add supers? Tip number four is gonna be about mite control in the spring. And finally, tip number five is about feeding bees in the spring. Let's get right into it with tip number one. What about making splits? Making splits is awesome because if you need to make a split, congratulations. That means that you have a hive that overwintered successfully because it's very populated. You made it through winter and now you need to make a split. So that's a good thing to make a split. Now, let me tell you, there are many ways to make a split and I don't own the corner of the perfect way to make a split. I'm gonna tell you how I do it and it works really well for me. And, uh, but there are many ways that you, you can make splits. You can have a complete walkaway split where basically you take off the top deep, off from the bottom deep, and put it on a bottom board and a top cover. And long as it adds eggs in both of your hive bodies, that walkaway split will work fine. One hive just has to raise a queen from an egg. So I like to do a similar thing, but here's what I like to do. I like to go to a hive that's very populated and I'll pull four frames out of it. Four seems like a magic number for me. And so I'll usually take two or three frames of brood of some sort, either capped over eggs, larvae, and then a frame or two of resources in case it starts raining in the spring and they don't have a lot of resources. Gotta have a couple of frames of resources. Now, when I'm talking about what's on those frames, I don't mean that that is all that has to be on that frame. Sometimes you're gonna have a frame of brood and it also has honey around the outside edges. That's what I'm talking about. But So you're gonna find uh, four frames that have something on them in the way of brood and resources. And you're gonna take the old queen in the original hive with those four frames and you're gonna move that new split to a new location. And that way what happens is you're preventing a swarm because by making that split, the original hive has lost their queen, so they can't swarm. They need to raise a new queen. They've lost a big chunk of bees, four or five frames, whatever you choose to make there. And so they feel like they swarmed. And so now they're gonna just kind of regroup after a lot of them are gone and their queen is gone, raising a new queen and raising up more bees to replace the ones that left. So it's just an easy way that works really well for me. Now, some caveats to that, uh, two specifically, would be uh, where do you move them to and will they all go back to the original hive? Uh, yes, they very can likely do that. If you have a lot of foragers on those four frames that you're moving to a split, then if you move them too close, those foragers are just gonna fly back to their original colony. They have it in their minds, you know, so well just to know where home is and they will go back home. A couple of ways that I try to do that is that I'll try to put a big symbol on the split, uh, move it away from the original colony facing a different direction next to a wall or something like that. And I'll put a big symbol, like a big black circle on it that I cut out of a piece of plastic, a big black triangle. And that way these bees will know that's their new home doesn't always work. Other times I make a split and I'll put a lawn chair, folded up lawn chair, right in front of the hive, lean it up against the hive. That way when the foragers go out, they're kind of like, oh, wait a minute, this looks different. And they may take a new orientation flight. The old traditional way that has been taught to uh, make a split so that they don't go back to the original hive is to move that split two or three miles away for a couple of weeks. That way the older foragers kind of die off or they reorientate to a new location. Then when you bring them back to your place, they reorientate to another new location. So those ways usually work pretty good. You can test and try that. But if yeah, if you just move, make a split and move it 
two or three feet away, you're likely going to lose all your foragers back to the mother ship. So be careful about that. The other caveat is how many frames do you really need to move? You know, four to me is a minimal number. I would say anywhere from four to 10. If your hives are, if your current hive, the original hive has maybe at least 18 out of 20 frames with bees on it, then you're pretty safe at, at moving, you know, uh, 10 frames out of there. But the reason I like only moving four is because I can still have a quick recovery of my original hive to replace the four frames that are gone with a new queen. And that way that hive can still be dedicated to make honey for me or even make another split should they continue to grow. Whereas my split isn't always going to be the one that will make me honey this year because they do have to build up kind of like a new package or a nucleus. And so I'm willing to sacrifice getting honey out of that hive. So you make a split in order to have another hive making honey next year. Does that make sense? If you want honey this year, try to keep that one hive together without making a split, which leads us into step number two, which is swarm control. Now, step number two, swarm control. Let me just say right now that it is so hard to control a swarm. You have to be dedicated. You have to have a lot of time on your hands. I would dare say if you're a busy person, you work a lot, you're gone away from home a lot, you don't have a lot of time to manage that colony, then you're likely going to find it very hard to control a swarm. To control a swarm, you really need to go out there about every 10 to 14 days and check for swarm cells. If you don't know what a swarm cell looks like, here's an example. This is what a swarm cell is. Swarm cells are located on the bottom of the frames where supersedure, meaning that they're replacing a queen that failed, those supersedure cells are often on the middle upper side of the frame where the swarm cells are located on the lower side of the frame. So you have to go out there about every 10 to 14 days and really look carefully. I don't mean just a very quick look. I mean, you've got to look everywhere. They're hard to find. They're hard to see. Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're on the bottom of a frame tucked away. You don't know what it is. Is that a drone cell? Is that a queen cell? And if you leave one, just one that you miss, they can still swarm. So the way to prevent swarms is to be diligent, cut those swarm cells out, make sure you have a queen in there before you start cutting out the swarm cells. A lot of times they've already swarmed and you don't know they have, your queen is gone and you take away all the queen cells, now you're queenless. So swarm prevention is oftentimes thought of as adding more boxes to give them more room. Got news for you. That doesn't always work and here's why. It doesn't always work because Bees have the instinct to reproduce in the spring. A lot of the swarming that happens is because that's how bees, that's how a colony makes another colony, reproduction. They want to make a colony to reproduce and make another colony, right? And so by you going out there and giving them more room, they're just going to swarm anyway. So it doesn't always help. Now, if that colony it's just heavily congested. If you've left them in one single deep and they're busting out of the seams, yeah, that's probably going to be a congestion swarm. And by giving them more room, that could really help a lot. But don't just think by throwing a super on top of your hive that overwintered that they have room up in that super that now they won't swarm. Now, they don't care a bit about that. They're going to swarm anyway. They're judging by the number of bees, the population, the queen pheromone, and the amount of uh, pheromones that are being passed around the hive, they're not looking at all, most of the time, about how much space they have. It has to do with a lot of other signals that the bees know about that you may not fully understand. So the best method of swarm control is to inspect it regularly and make sure you have a queen walking around laying eggs and continue to cut out those swarm cells that they're trying to make and then give them more room to expand at the same time. That way, this colony will not swarm and you can add super after super after super, force them to add and make a lot of honey for you. Which leads to tip number three about making honey. When do you add honey supers in the spring coming out of winter? Got a call today from a B Team 6 member. So I'm making this video on April the 4th and our temperatures in the next few days are decent, 40s, low 50s, but we have some nights getting below freezing, 31 degrees. And I said to the B Team 6 member 
little too early to put a you know a queen excluder and then add honey uh, supers on top. A little too soon for that here in Illinois. I realize this doesn't apply to you in the deep south or out west where the weather is so nice and we all envy where you live so much. We all want to move to where you live. Yes, you can leave comments down below and brag about your beautiful weather if you want us all to feel bad. Go ahead and do that. But most of us are in the Midwest up here in the north, you know. Wow, there's a lot of beekeepers in the Midwest and north that are still waiting for better weather here in April. So the best thing to do is make sure the colony isn't going to cluster anymore in in the spring. So like if you add a bunch of supers on top of a queen excluder and happens to be that all the bees want to go up there because it gets really cold and your queen is left underneath that queen excluder, that can be a bad scenario. So the best thing to do is wait and look at your forecast. Make sure even your nights aren't going to be terribly cold. And once you get out of, uh, I usually say 40, 45 degree lows at night, you're pretty safe to go ahead and add super. So for me, I usually just have this physical way of determining when to add my honey supers. And that is when I start to have a good nectar flow. And nectar flow to me starts with a good crop of dandelions. So I march outside, I look around, I see what my dandelions are doing. If they're starting to bloom in heavy, heavy numbers of bloom of dandelions everywhere, time to put the supers on. I'm in, I'm in safe territory at that point. Now, should you put 10 supers on at once? Never. Small high beetle can be a problem, and especially if you're using drawn out uh, combs from last year's supers, you're going to have all those extra supers unprotected by bees because it's just too much room to protect. I like to only give my bees one at the most two supers at a time. That way I've got bees up there chasing my small high beetles around, keeping them from overpopulating. So never add a bunch of boxes all at once. Usually add one let them draw out about five frames of that super. And once they start capping or uh, drawing out comb on five frames of a super, add a second super, wait till five frames are drawn out. Just keep going right up the chimney as long as they keep adding five at a time. Now we come into my control in the spring, tip number four, because when you have a lot of populations uh, emerging, you're gonna have more mites coming out. Remember this friends, a lot of mites overwintered with your colony. Your bees kept them warm, thank you bees, and they just kind of stayed in the cluster with your bees. They even reproduced during the winter in your colony. I know it's terrible. A lot of people think that all the mites just die off in the winter time, but they don't. They reproduce, they continue to be part of the bees um, cluster during the winter time. Doggone it, it's so aggravating. Ugh. But anyway, there's the mite. And mites are a big problem. If you're a fan of my YouTube channel here, you are surely aware that I constantly tell you to monitor and manage mite control. Spring is a good time to do that because your populations are starting to ramp up. And if you can get a hold and, and kind of control your mites right now, you don't have to wait until the explosion later in July and August. So I always recommend that you try to get mites under control by the use of a green drone comb, powdered sugar method always works a little bit. Using a screen bottom board helps some mites to fall off, especially when you powdered sugar uh, your, your, high, your colony to make those mites fall off. And also, I believe later in the year, like July, August, September, in breaking the queen's brood cycle by caging her uh, for about a week, and then uh, that's breaking the brood cycle of the queen, which then breaks the brood cycle of the viral mite destructor at the time when they are really expanding at the fastest rate. Now, before I get into tip number four, even more about my control, let me just take a moment to ask you to please subscribe. Would you do that for me, please? I love seeing more subscribers. And uh, if you would do that, click on the subscribe button. It does a lot when you give a thumbs up. Go ahead and take a moment, give me a thumbs up and leave a comment below about something that you really enjoy about this video. I would appreciate it a lot. Now, more talk about mite control. I know that a lot of you want me to tell you, just give me one simple way to make all my mite problems go away. What method do you use, David? Why do you use it? Tell me where to buy it. 
I don't want to have to do all the research myself. Well, what fun is that in beekeeping? <laughs> I don't want to give you all the answers, plus it's different where you live, how large your colony is, what's your personal philosophy, and your opinion about chemicals really uh, boils down to your personal preference. And uh, I don't want you to do everything that I do because uh, I may believe in things differently than you do. So I don't use a lot of treatments until it gets really bad. A lot of you have seen uh, many colonies that I ran through the winter this year without treating last year. And up to this point, they're really doing good and haven't had a chance to do a mite test yet. But I dare say we're going to find a lot of mites in there and we may have to use some acids on the to, to kill the mites. We'll see when the weather gets warmer. But it brings me now we're between tip number four and tip number five. We're still talking about mite control. But I want to give a shout out and answer a question about my control. By the way, this is a shout out. Thank you for being a subscriber. Paul says, question about OA. Now, OA means acylic acid. Paul says, I pull my supers when using OA. Someone told me the studies have now shown you can use the honey after OA treatments. I'm doubtful. Won't use it myself and find no info on the subject. Have you heard anything on the subject? Thank you for all the information. Hey, Paul, thanks a lot, and thanks for being a subscriber. And yeah, you fit right into tip number four in the spring. Can you use something like a salic acid while the honey supers are on there? Interesting thing. I have noticed, like probably you have, that there's sometimes it says you can and sometimes you said it can't. And so what I did to answer your question and what you should always do, here's the answer to your question. Always go by the label. Now, let me say that better. The label is always the law. It's always the law. If you bought OA, only comes from one place that makes it uh, APA or AP Bioxyl, I think. And they always put a label on their product. That label becomes a law. And so it doesn't matter what changes in the future or what it was in the past. It doesn't matter. You cannot. I think it, it's, it's against the law. It's against the federal law for you to go outside of the label. So all you have to do to answer that question, Paul, is to go back to your package and read what the label says. That label will tell you the answer to this question. That's why I can't do it because labels can change. So if I know in my head that my label says yes or no, and I tell you what my label says, your label could be different because like you said, there's a lot of labels that change. So here's the best way to do it. I'll show you. Here's an example. I went to uh, Better B and they actually sell it. They have a link right here to click on. I clicked on the link for the full label. And so you can see here, it talks a little bit about it. And then down below, you can see right here where I'm circling that it says right here that you can use it with Honey Supers on. That's that particular package. So always look at the package that you receive when you receive your uh, OA you got to look at your label on your package. Is that clear enough? Let's let it be done. I think you got the hint from that. Label's the law. Now, I've got other videos showing you how to use a green drone comb. I've made videos, check them out, how to, how to break the queen's brood cycle. I've got videos on how to do a powdered sugar shake to, to help mites drop off. I've got a, a lot of videos talking about the different types of ways that you can help control mites in the spring. But tip number four, please get your mites under control before you hit the season when they're gonna be most prolific is when your hives are producing the most brood. Tip number five is all about should you be feeding your bees in the spring? You know what? Um, it depends. Like if you're in a place right now where your bees are bringing in a lot of nectar, no. Never feed your bees if you have honey supers on because you don't want sugar in your honey supers. Uh, honey supers should be made up of nectar from flowers not sugar that your bees are bringing up and taking up into your honey supers. Oh, this doesn't make sense. I shouldn't have to say that, <laughs> but I'll say it. Some of you are like, wow, I never thought about that. No, don't feed them if you got honey supers on. 
So that's a rule of thumb. So if you want to build up the colony a little bit before you throw the honey supers on, certainly you could feed them. Uh, I recommend a top feeder. And actually we have those back online again. If you, uh, early, if you get there early enough and order those, we put another hundred online. Some of you really love my burns feeding systems. Good time to use those. And anyway, you can feed them from the top before you put the supers on. The best time to put the honey supers on is when you know that your bees are bringing in the nectar. You know that because you take a drive around, you see a lot of flowers blooming, and you see your bees really working. Yeah, go ahead and drop some supers on, stop feeding them, and put the honey supers on. Now, I'll stop feeding my bees, again, when I see that I've got a decent honey flow, stop feeding, and put the honey supers on. Okay, let's give a shout out to some subscribers. Thank you for leaving comments and thank you for being a subscriber. First one is from Charles and Charles says, Hey David, I just caught my first swarm today in Greenville, South Carolina. Hey, if you've never caught a swarm before, gosh, that's so much fun. It's almost surreal when you're out there catching those swarms like that. So great job, Charles. I hope, I got, I hope you got some good videos. Oh, Corey of All Trade says, Maryland mug coming your way. Hope it replaces the one you broke. Thanks for all you do. Well, thanks, Corey. I really appreciate that. I look forward to getting that mug. I'll probably get like five of them, but I'll feature them on uh, my channel here. Oh, and let me remind you, got the giveaway coming up. But before we do, a few more shout outs. This one is Jerry Green. Jerry says, David, hello from Indiana. I'm a first year beekeeper and will be receiving my bees in about a week. This cooler weather has me worried about installing my bees. Are there any precautions I should take or am I just worried uh, needlessly? Thanks. Love watching the coffee time. Hey, coffee time. Um, another coffee time fan. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jerry. Yeah, I mean, I understand the worry about installing packages in cooler weather. Got a video coming up that I'm going to make this week in a few days about that. So hang tight. I'll get you a video to tell you what to do, Jerry. Oh, and I wanted to show you guys this. I got a package in the mail. They, uh, my staff brought it to my attention when they saw it. And look at that, it comes with a nice letter. And it also came with something interesting inside. Look at this, you're not gonna, not gonna believe this. Look at that. You know what those are? <laughs> the way I'm holding it, it should tell you what it is, right? These are actually turkey feathers. I made a video not too long ago and I was telling you guys how instead of using a bee brush, I even showed you that I often use these turkey feathers and they're stiff enough to gently just brush bees off of frames. And Bill in Western Massachusetts was kind enough to write me a two page, very nice letter telling me about his beekeeping experiences and giving me just this wonderful, wonderful amount of uh, turkey feathers that I'll be using in future videos. Oh, there goes one now. To actually, to actually uh, brush bees off of the frame. So I appreciate that uh, a lot, Bill. That, that was really kind of you. Now, I want to help you today by a giveaway. It's time to give away another Ultimate Beekeeping course, an online course that it's a course that many of you have purchased and many of you have told me how much you enjoy it. And today you can win that Ultimate Beekeeping course. It actually comes with many courses all bundled together, not all of them, but a lot of them. And it's free if you answer this question correctly. And you have to be the first one to leave a comment with the correct answer. Okay, our giveaway question, remember, the first person to answer this question correctly will win our ultimate beekeeping class. Online beekeeping course worth $269. All right, are you ready? Get yourself into position to answer this question quickly because I know a lot of you know the answers. This question has four answers to it. I will accept three answers. I already have the answers. They're written out. You have to give three out of four reasons why it's beneficial to have a marked queen. Remember, you have to have my three answers. <laughs> I've already written them down. They're, they're actually recorded. They're down. If you match at least three of the four that I've written down, you will win the ultimate class giveaway, the first person to answer it. Good luck, and let's leave those comments down below, and I'll choose the first person to answer correctly.
If this is your first time to stop by the channel, thanks for dropping in and you may want to become a beekeeper. Here's a great video I put together on how to start beekeeping. It's really good. I go kind of like piece by piece, moment by moment, what you're supposed to do to get started. It's a great little beginning video on getting you started in beekeeping. Take a look. See you next time.